Good morning, I'm Jodo Wale, professor at the University of Bologna, and I will be your instructor for the lessons on karst. Now we will see how caves form due to these dissolution processes. Now we know what we will be seeing. I'm going to explain very fast what we can see in caves and how we can interpret the morphologies we see in caves. You can read the caves, in fact. The, the things we see in a cave can tell you a lot about the story of the cave, about the age, about how it formed, if it was underwater or above water and whatever. We're talking about geological stuff, so discontinuities like bedding planes, fractures, joints. Most of caves form, form along open paths in the rock that were there before and were enlarged. The macrostructural setting, if it's a bedding that is flat lying or horizontal or completely vertical or folded, and the type of water coming in. It can be allergenic, coming from out of the karst area, or local or diffuse or hypogenic or whatever. We will see. There's in fact three main areas in the cave which have different morphologies. There's a Vedo zone, which is above the water table. So there we have only trickling water and sheets of water going down. We have an oscillation zone, or epiphreatic zone is the name here, where we have the water table going up and down. So in a certain moment of the year, it's underwater. In most of the time of the year, it's above the water. And then we have an area that is always underwater. That area, of course, is difficult to visit. You, you need to go do scuba diving, no? Otherwise, you can find these morphologies in the air, so no more water, because the water table dropped. So you can see still the morphologies, and you can walk in there. No? With these typical uh, shapes of galleries. For example, in the Vedo zone, so where the water trickles and goes, forms sheets and goes down, Typically, the conduits, the cave passages, follow the dip of the beds. That's quite typical. So if you have a cave where you have the bedding clearly visible and you see that the cave follows this, you know it's a cave that formed above the water table, for sure. In the phreatic zone, meaning the underwater zone, typically conduits follow the strike of the beds. So you have a bedding plane that goes like this, but your tunnel goes like this. It, it doesn't care about bedding, it follows the strike. The contact zone below is very important, there's a sort of base level we, we can talk about. So you have the limestone that is above impervious rocks, not soluble rocks normally. So you have shales or granites or whatever, that's not castifiable rock, and you have a package of limestone above. The cave, of course, when the river goes in, will follow the contact will follow the impervious basement for quite a while. And that uh, influences the shape of the cave, of course. It cannot go lower and it will not go above because it's the easiest path. In the upstream Suplamonte area, which is this one, all the caves follow the contact between limestones, dolo stones, and the granites below, or the phyllites. So the shape of the cave is more or less the shape of the basement rock. When we go downstream, which is the part in which we are, the caves uh, have left this contact zone because the contact zone between, between these two rocks is below the water table. So the caves follows more or less the water table level and is completely in limestone. No. So it doesn't care anymore about these impervious rocks below. What a cave normally does in the beginning, when the water goes into a karst mountain, is going down. So it starts carving a carbonate mountain and it will try and go to the base level as fast as possible. Meaning, in the beginning of caves, often we have shafts. So entrances normally are vertical ones in the upstream area. Meaning ropes, you have to go down by ropes. And you can go down 400, 500 meters immediately. And then, in the end, you find or the basement or a, ver a horizontal cave system. And then you can start walking with some small drops. So normally it's not easy to get in. 
tell you you need to work a bit before you can get to the sizable easy galleries. Mm. Often it's like this. Uh, these can be uh, the passages, the horizontal passages, can be straight or can be meandering. That depends on the quantity of water that flows in the caves. If there's not a large quantity of water, the water will form sort of meander-like passages. If there's a lot of water, it goes straight. If it has fractures, it will follow the fracture. So this can be seen quite easily in caves. Sagruta cave is a straight line, meaning there was a lot of water and it's on a fracture, when it formed at least. A lot of passages uh, tend to, this is a, the early passage, it will go up and down normally because it will follow sort of fractures, the easiest paths. But once the cave passage is formed, this thing will evolve into something like this. Because uh, down here there will be sedimentation, up here there will be erosion. The water will erode the vault of the cave passage and will shield the lower passages from dissolution and erosion because there will be sedimentation going on there. So in the end, this thing will evolve in a horizontal sort of passage. So if you find this, this means that you are in an early passage that has been abandoned in an early development of the cave. This means it's a mature, a very old passage because it had time to evolve to a horizontal plane. Paragenesis is the name. If you have a passage that goes down and up, in the lower part there's sedimentation. The sediment shields the floor from dissolution and erosion, so there's no more entrenching, and the vault will start eroding. So it, it will go upward. That's something strange. Uh, that's something typical of caves. In an outside world, the river will entrench all the time. You, you can't see a river that goes up, you know, it goes down. In caves, you can have a passage that goes up, <laughs> that carves up. So you can have sometimes even a passage that is very, very big, you know, and you, you see the size, which is very big, and you say, okay, this is a water passage. This, this was full of water. And you calculate the quantity of water that flew in there, and you come to enormous sizes of water, which are not explainable by rain. That's because, in fact, the passage was completely filled with sediments and it was only carving upwards. <laughs> and then the sediment was taken away and you find a big gallery. So it's quite strange. This is something that is underestimated by many cavers. So you see a big passage, you say, there was a lot of water. That's not true. Maybe there was a lot of sediment <laughs> and not a lot of water. That's typical of Pelagians. Say, so if you have a, a, a passage, and you have not a lot of water, the water is not able to take away sediment, so it is accumulating. And the water will continue carving the vault, so it goes upward. No? Once you get up there and there's a, more water coming in, this water, more water means, okay, I can carry away sediment, starts carving and goes taking away the sediment. And normally it it's, can take away almost everything. It's crazy, huh? And in some places, you, can, you have to carefully look at the morphology of the cave and find pieces of sediment still stuck on the wall to understand that, in fact, it was completely filled with sediments. This is a typical phreatic passage, meaning an underwater passage. Cave divers normally find this. You can see and understand that it's a subaqueous passage because the water filling the complete conduit eats away the rock all over the place. So you have a sort of rounded morphology, tubes. They, they are called phreatic tubes. So if you can explore this, it mean, means that the water table went down. This was abandoned by the water very rapidly. And this was an underwater passage. These things normally don't follow bedding planes, as I told before. They follow the strike of the, the passages, of the bedding planes. Uh, or go up and down. They do whatever they want. On the water, everything is eating away. So but that's typical phreatic conduit in Austria. It can have a uh, control by bedding planes and fractures. So it enlarges faster along the bedding plane or along the fracture. But often it's like in the earlier case, there's no fracture, there's no bedding plane, there's only the tube in pure rock. What is very 
typically seen in caves is paleothems, of course. That's the, what, caves, uh, what makes the caves attractive. Uh, tourists go into caves and what they will remember is it's cold, it's dark, but normally it's not dark because there's light in there, and there's paleothems. They will talk about stalactite and stalagmites. You know? That's more or less the same reaction we have seen before, but it goes toward the left. So it goes from solution, out of the solution, it becomes solid again. So there's calcite forming in the cave. That's a process that tends to fill up caves. We will see this in many places. Uh, I will show it to you in Tiscali, for example. So if this process goes on, it can completely even fill older cave passages. So you can, fill, you can find conduits that are completely filled with calcite. That was a cave that has been filled completely by calcite. These are the words you can see in many books, stalactites, stalagmites, and so on. No? These are all made by different types of uh, flowing water. Uh, the most typical one is droplets. So you have the vault of the cave, there's a droplet coming out, loses CO2, spits out calcium carbonate and then falls down. Falls on the ground, leaves other CO2, uh, gets rid of a lot of CO2 again when it falls down and, and it, it forms a stalagmite. So on the roof we have stalactites which are falling from the roof and stalagmites down below which are growing upwards. These have a hole in the middle, so there's a feeding tube. The stalagmites instead are completely compact. So if you, if you find them broken, you can understand the difference. Also the shape is different, we will see them. If it's running water, so more water going, not only droplets, you have a sheet of water flowing, then there's everywhere a deposition of calcium carbonate, calcite, and you have floors, complete floors covered with this mineral, white or yellowish. These are uh, formed across columns, basins and whatever. There's also speleothems forming underwater. We will see many of them in Sagrunta and also in Tiscali, like the cave pearls. Uh, these are spherical uh, speleothems. Everything in the cave has to be left in a cave, unless you, you want to study it, of course. Speleothems are done by evaporation and whatever. There's a lot of processes going on in a cave that make different types of speleothems. These are stalactites. This is a drapery, a sort of like a sheet like this. No? These are soda straws, which are very small tubes, about four millimeter in size, with a feeding tube inside, so the water dripping through it. This is a feeding tube like this, a sort of uh, soda straw. Uh, depends on the drip rate. If it's very fast, there's no deposit. You don't give time for calcium carbonate to come out of the water. If it's a bit slower, you have a soda straw forming. If it's even slower than this, you will have a stalactite forming. So it depends on the flow rate, the quantity of droplets falling each second. Stalagmites are the ones that grow from the ground upwards, so they won't have a feeding tube. They're fed from the droplet falling from above. Another thing is the splash popcorn. We will see this in uh, Tiscali, yes. That's the droplets falling. If there's a lot of water falling, they splash around and the splashing makes a lot of speleothems on the walls. This is something very special we will see in Tiscali again, which is a droplet that at so about two meters distance from the roof, because of turbulence of the falling droplet, get, gains a speed and it loses small droplets on the sides, making a sort of ring around the central dripping point. So you, you have this where the droplet, the main droplet is falling and all the small droplets fall on the same distance from the center of the, the droplet. It's very strange. This has been described only about 20 years ago. So before we didn't understand how it formed. And there's one in Tiscali, we can see. The flowstone pavements are a sheet of water flowing on the ground. So there's calcite precipitation everywhere. This can form also flowstone barriers, which we will see. These are closed basins with water inside, and it makes a sort of staircase going down. Uh, this is a sort of balcony that has deposited above sediments, so it's flat underneath because that was the river level before, and later the river went down in trenching, 
and it left this stuff suspended above. Very nice stuff is capillary water that forms halactites. Normally, speleothems are gravity controlled, they're vertical. This stuff goes wherever it wants, it doesn't care about gravity, because capillary water can go in any direction, so it doesn't care. There's a lot of pressure in the water in the feeding tube to get, let it go in any direction. So there's Spilothem forming, we will see this in sociocos especially, and we will talk about this. Popcorn, uh, the cave pearls, or pisoliti in Italian, and the cave rafts. That's uh, something growing underwater, so it's a free spilothem. You can pick it up and place it again where you left. This is evaporation that's on the water, so on the surface of the water, there's small sheets of sort of, uh, uh, yeah cornflakes <laughs> floating on the water and at a certain moment it can go down in the water when it gets too heavy. That's typical especially in hot, hot caves. In New Mexico it's full like this. And this is a sort of ideal cave where you have all the speleothems put together. So some form in thermal water, some flow, uh, form underwater, some form by dripping water or by sheets or whatever. There's many types of speleothems. More or less one-third of what you see here, we will see in the caves we will be visiting.